Howdy folks. So I've been working a lot with vintage computers lately. Um, I'm currently building up a uh, 586 system and getting modern software to run on it. So uh, I'll have a video for, uh, for that up uh, soon if you're interested. But I wanted to break this out into a separate video so that people could find it directly. Uh, and it has to do with these things. These are uh, SD card to IDE uh, sort of drive emulators. And um, I want to talk a little bit about these and about the problem they have when you're trying to use a Linux operating system with these things. Um, there's been a number of posts on online uh, about how these things don't work with Linux. Uh, it's like as soon as you install Linux onto them, they just they, they, the drive shows doesn't show up as bootable. There's no partition table anymore. It's almost like it's corrupting the data. Um, but it works fine when you use Windows 95 and 98. Um, and so uh, since this, there doesn't appear to be a posted solution online, I want to talk about how you can fix the problem and why they're doing this. Um, but I also just want to talk a little, a little bit in general about these things because they're kind of interesting. So um, for anyone who's, who's not familiar, um, Generally speaking, when you're working with sort of vintage electronics, um, whether they be in a hobby capacity or even in, in sort of like industrial applications, um, finding old hard drives is, is kind of difficult because, of course, old hard drives are not very reliable anymore. Um, and uh, you can't just buy new hard drives with, you know, the, the ID or PATA interface. Um, and you can't use more modern drives because they're too large. Um, there are actually maximum sizes supported by a lot of these older systems. So one really convenient thing that you can do is you can use um, like you know SD cards, um, you know modern storage, which is uh, more reliable and also likely a lot faster than the original storage, uh, and just pop it into one of these uh, sort of emulator devices, and you're good to go. And um, you know they're fully compatible. They just show up as a normal drive. And uh, the beauty of it is, you know, you can just, of course, pop the, pop the card out um, and connect it to a card reader, you know, transfer files, pop it back in. Um, it's really quite convenient. Now, a lot of people will use uh, Compact Flash. Uh, and the reason for that is because Compact Flash, um, the interface for Compact Flash is almost identical um, to the, the IDE interface. So um, in, in, in most cases, they're, they're perfectly compatible. And uh, you can buy adapter boards uh, and they really are just truly two connectors on a board. There's no active electronics at all on them. Um, but I don't happen to have any, any other compact flash devices or uh, card readers or anything like that. So I wanted to go with the, the SD card approach. And the SD cards um, are, of course, you know, they're, they're, I just have lots of them. And uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're more ubiquitous in, in my opinion. So um, that's great. But of course, they're very different uh, as far as electrical uh, interface goes. So you're going to need a device uh, to do a little bit more emulation. Um, and uh, that's what uh, the active electronics on these boards are for. Now, I got these things different years. I got these things years apart. Um, but you'll notice they, uh, they have some similarities. Uh, but this one, uh, just for, uh, to go over it, this one is a 44-pin. Um, so this one takes a micro SD card, and this is the 44-pin for the 2.5-inch drives. And uh, this one here takes a full-size card, and it is the 40-pin for more desktop-oriented um, uh, systems and of course it has uh, multiple power options. Now, of course you can get the smaller one, you can use one of these um, just simple adapters uh, to take the 44 pin to the 40 pin if you want to use these on a desktop, um, but of course they cost more so I wouldn't recommend it. So uh, this is the original one I had. I bought this one recently uh, and I'll explain that in a moment uh, after I discovered this whole Linux compatibility issue. But uh, you'll notice the, uh, the similarities here. Uh, they ha both have this, this chip on it uh, with this wonderful QC Pass sticker here, um, and these were different vendors, you know, years apart. Basically, all of these things that you find, regardless of where you get them uh, or what the the board layout is, uh, they're basically the same ubiquitous uh, cloned design. Um, so, as far as I understand, there was a company uh, a while back called Syn Syn Syntech, uh, and they actually made a an SD card to Compact Flash adapter or a series of adapters, and ultimately they the Chinese cloned them. And so what you find uh, probably are like 99% clone devices now. Um, and they're all based around this, which I believe is made by, I think it's a company called Key Technologies, and it's the, it's the FC1307, if I remember correctly. And this is a, like a, a chip dedicated to interfacing uh, the PATA, like PATA to um, a, a bunch of other interfaces. It's got like, uh, like SD, uh, MMC, SPY, uh, RAW Flash. It's got a whole bunch of other uh, like different interfaces. Um, and there's like a small, there's a small like EEPROM here with a little, like, I think it's like 64K of code, um, which is about half empty, by the way. Um, so th there's, you know, clearly they're quite straightforward in what they do. Um, and you can't find any real data on these things. They're, uh, they're completely, um, you know, uh, under NDA. 
Um, so unfortunately we don't have a data sheet for this exact part. Uh, and so even though they have like an, like I think it's like an 8032 core in them, um, you know, it's really not worth decompiling the, the, the code and trying to, to, you know, figure out how they work and everything because without the register maps and stuff, there's not a whole lot that you're going to be able to do. But we don't really need to get to that level, um, as I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a moment, because uh, we can't actually fix this Linux incompatibility problem um, without having to sort of modify the devices. So I, I originally was using this one. This one reports as a Syntec, Syntec E. Uh, there's an I at the end, uh, and I think that that's uh, their futile attempt uh, at getting away from uh, legal issues um, from cloning the hardware. So this one reports as a Syntec E device um, at uh, version 1.2. This one uh, has no brand at all. They've stripped that from the strings that it outputs. Um, and this one reports version 1.4. Both of these experience the same problem. So it doesn't appear to be a firmware... Um, well, it's a firmware issue, but it doesn't appear that there's any firmware out there that, uh, that works uh, correctly. Um, and so to explain the issue... This thing works fine when you use Windows 95, Windows 98, anything like that. Um, it works perfectly fine. Uh, but if you want to install, like let's say, like Linux, it uh, doesn't matter what, what, what type of Linux or what version, um, you'll install it to the drive, everything will be fine. You can even reboot into the OS, everything is fine. Um, but as soon as you turn the system off and then turn it back on again, uh, it will no longer be bootable. Um, the, you know, the BIOS will say that it's not a valid boot sector. And not only that, but if you actually do a little bit more digging, um, it won't even have a partition table on it anymore. Um, and so it'll appear like the SD card has become corrupted. Um, but the device works fine if you put like a Windows card back in it. Um, and so these devices are, um, you know, uh, some people have basically given up on this problem. Some people have some said that, you know, they can switch file systems from ext4 to ext2, and then sometimes it works, but not really. Um, the bootloader doesn't seem to matter. There's a whole bunch of things that people have done, um, and no one has really gotten to the, the, the root of the problem. So I thought I'd do a little bit of digging here uh, and figure out what's actually going on, and I do have a, a method, uh, a pretty easy one, of how to get around this problem. So what's happening here is these devices, um, they're doing a little bit more than what they should, um, and they're actually reading the master boot record, which is sector zero, and they're also reading um, into the first partition on the drive. And they um, sort of naively, they assume that that partition will be FAT32. Um, and so if you're running something like old Windows 9X, that's fine because it's going to be LBA FAT32 and it can you know, read all of the, the data structures just fine. I don't know why it needs to know that information, but nonetheless, it, it does. Um, however, if you don't use FAT32, like, you know, you're using Linux, for example, um, it makes some bad assumptions, tries to read some data, and it doesn't seem to have any sanitization on that data. And as a result, um, the entire... Um, the entire virtual disk that it exposes is off by two LBAs. So it actually shifts sector zero to, she to sector two. And then it inserts two sectors at the beginning. And I'm not entirely sure what those two sectors are. Um, the second one is all binary code. Um, the first one is uh, strings um, with a, a, a reversed endianness. Um, from the firmware. So it's a little interesting. Now, I couldn't find those exact strings um, in the firmware, and I couldn't find the binary code in the firmware. So I believe that those two sectors are actually coming out of the RAM buffer that's inside this chip, um, because, the, because the, they're not in the ROM. It's not like it's just showing us ROM. And it's also not showing us a cached like a cache line of the SD card because I also did matches for that. Uh, again, I checked for endianness and all sorts of stuff like that. So I think this weird behavior is actually exposing some of the internal RAM on the device, um, which is is kind of it's just bad programming is really what it is. They both do the same thing, and so that explains why a it's no longer bootable because the boot sector doesn't have it's not a boot sector anymore. And since in the MBR you know you have to follow. Uh, the end of the first sector to get the partition table. Of course, it's no longer there, so it doesn't show a partition table. Um, the good news is it doesn't actually corrupt your SD card. Um, so your SD card will be perfectly fine. Um, it's just these devices that have the problem. And uh, I tried to screw around for quite a while um, to narrow down exactly what needs to be done. 
uh, to get around this issue. Um, and so what I've found um, from my sort of uh, sort of analysis, we'll call it, um, is it reads it reads the MBR, so that's sector zero, and it also reads the first three sectors of the first partition. Um, and in FAT32, um, there is a there's a, a boot sector uh, as the first sector in the partition, and then there's the it's the I think it's the BIOS. There's there's a special I can't remember the name for the, all this crap. Um, but there's 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 two other sectors at the very beginning of the FAT32 partition which contain other metadata. And it's for some reason reason parsing all three of those sectors. You need all three of those for this to work. I tried putting in you know the magic signatures and a couple other things, um, and none of that none of that works. Um, so the solution is really quite straightforward, uh, and that is you you need to put in a dummy partition um, for these to satisfy these devices. Um, so that you can get Linux to work. So if you're installing Linux on an SD card for the first time, when you do your partitioning, at the very beginning of the drive, make a small partition, like it can be just a couple megabytes, it doesn't matter how large it is, um, and it must, be, it must be the very first partition, like the very first lo uh, logical, like primary, sorry, the very first primary partition, not logical, the very first primary partition must be FAT32, and it must be at the beginning of the disk. If you satisfy those re three requirements, it doesn't matter what you do to the rest of the, the device. So you can create your ext4 partitions, your swap partitions, everything else after that, doesn't matter. Um, and it also doesn't matter what bootloader you use, whether it's Grub, Lilo, doesn't matter. They will, it'll all work fine as long as you have a FAT32 partition at the beginning of the disk, uh, and it's the first partition. And this thing reads it, doesn't do anything with it, um, but it, it needs it in order for it to not exhibit this bug. So that is the uh, that is the, the fix, essentially. Um, and it, this is fully compatible with like Grub's core.image, which you know sits between the MBR and the first partition, um, so that's fine. Uh, it also doesn't exactly matter what the alignment of that partition is. Um, of course, DOS is gonna wanna align it um, to probably like the 64th sector um, because, you know, space is at a premium. If you do modern partitioning, it's going to probably align to the, the mebibyte. So you're probably going to get, you know, one or two megabytes down. Um, that doesn't matter. Um, so it, 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 it does follow the MBR. And, uh, but I, I found that if you put it at like the end of the disk, it doesn't seem to want to go there. So uh, I would definitely make sure it's at the beginning. Now, if you're someone like me, um, and you've already spent several hours installing your operating system because you have a really slow old computer, and you've now got an SD card that's got uh, you know a fully fully functional operating system on it, except it doesn't have this dummy partition, um, you don't. Now, obviously, you, you could just do it all over again, but you don't have to do that. So what what I did um, was I just opened the you know I, I put the SD card in a card reader on a modern system used um, either, you can either, either use parted or gparted if you want sort of, you know, graphics tools. And, uh, you know, resize and move the primary partition down, so make a little bit of space at the beginning of the disk. Um, you know, that's going to take some time depending on how fast your SD card is and how big it is. I'm using four gig cards, so it's actually not that, not, doesn't take that long. Um, once you have that space, you know, make a new primary partition, um, and that's going to be, you know, FAT32, uh, format it and everything. And it's going to put it, of course, at the end of the the... It's going to put it as the last partition. Uh, and then you can use something like FDisk um, to fix the partition ordering. Um, so there's like there's, a, there's an advanced menu, an expert menu. I think it's like under the X. Uh, there's, like a, there's, a, there's, a, yeah, there's like a fixed partition order, and that will um, go logically from the big first LBA to the last. So that'll make it partition one, which is one of the requirements. Um, that will break your bootloader, but it will not, um, it won't cause as big of an issue as you might think um, because... Normally, you would easily just, you know, just bind some uh, Linux, like Binic, uh, Linux VFSs and then just shoot into the, the OS and install the bootloader. But, of course, you can't do that on a modern system because your modern system is going to be, you know, a 64-bit, um, you know, uh, like AMD 64-based system. And, of course, the binaries that it's going to want to install are uh, not going to be compatible with your retro computer, likely. Um, so what you can actually do is just insert it into your, into your adapter, uh, boot it up. You're going to get a Grub Rescue shell. Um, that's how you know that it, 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 it's, it's working. That means the adapter's bug has been worked around. Um, and then from there, you can just set the, uh, the, uh, the, vari the grub variables to where your boot partition is and uh, you know, just, just tell it which partition it's on. Uh, and then you can just 
put Grub into normal mode and boot your OS and then just uh, reinstall the bootloader um, from within the OS. Um, doing this is not going to uh, like permanently destroy uh, any of those data structures. You'll be able to boot with the Grub Rescue shell uh, and actually just reinstall the bootloader from the system itself, which eliminates the, all of the, the, the sort of uh, cross-architecture issues that you may run into. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I guess, sort of what I know about these things. Um, I, I'm not really going to go into any more reverse engineering of these things because um, I, I, I don't really need to at this point. Um, but if you, yeah, if you ever want to use Linux on these things, just make sure you put the FAT32 partition there. Um, you know, I've been using this one um, for several years at this point, um, and it's, it's perfectly fine. Uh, these things are perfectly serviceable. Um, other than this bug, they seem to be pretty good. Um, they're not the fastest things out there. Um, like, you know, if you put a really high speed card in there, you're not going to get the, m m the highest speed possible. But for a lot of these, uh, retro systems, which is what I'm, I'm using these for, it, it doesn't matter uh, at all. Um, this is going to be way faster than the original disc anyway. You're going to saturate, you know, the UDMA, um, whatever your board's capable of doing. Um, I find that these are, 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 are a lot nicer than the, than the small ones. I needed this for a laptop project that I did. It was a 286 project that uh, never saw the light of day because the board was beyond economical repair. But um, this is, uh, this is I'd definitely say it's worth it. I think they're like 20 bucks Canadian. They're not, they're not terribly expensive. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I'm just waffling on. So I just thought I'd uh, share that kind of information uh, with you. Um, and if anyone has any questions, let me know in the comments. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll make sure I post uh, an update on my uh, 586 because it is quite interesting and you'll, uh, you'll see this in use there. So until then, thanks for watching.